Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. This season, I have given quite a few arguments uh, for Christian anarchism and against statism, uh, or polyarchy, whatever you want to call it. Um, there are a lot of those that I would strongly get behind and uh, think make a lot of sense. And um, then there are others, which um, some of which I've added more as addendums into the season, uh, and this being one of those, which are more exploratory, uh, exploratory argumentations. So the episode today is something that um, I kind of I thought about for a little bit, but you know I may be wrong about it, but I, I think it's um, a good exploratory look at something. Um, that you can feel free to critique and push back on because it hasn't been like reviewed or peer reviewed or anything. Um, nevertheless, I think it's something that that makes a lot of sense and want to put it out there. So chew on it. Uh, don't take it as brute fact. Uh, don't take anything I say as brute fact. But especially something like this, which is more exploratory. Um, you know, think through it and work through it and bounce it off of other people and uh, discuss discuss it. But essentially, uh, this the uh, the episode today is based on an article that I wrote uh, a, a while back, um, and it's it's taking a look at the Book of John. And so, in the Book of John, you get a lot of these um, elevated ideas. Like John is probably the most Christological book in terms of uh, his development of Christology, and there there are a lot of like spiritualized elements in there, right? You get um, Jesus as the Logos and the Word in the beginning with God, right? It, it's it's very elevated. Or you get Nicodemus and the new birth. Or uh, you get uh, just different episodes talking about the Spirit in ways that aren't really emphasized in other books. Um, or the kingship of Jesus is strongly emphasized here as pitted against Caesar. And uh, John 18.36, which is only found in the book of John, which is, my kingdom is not of this world, right? So um, what, what I want to do in this article is specifically for the John 1836, which is often used um, to support statism, this, this idea that, oh, well, no, you know, Jesus's kingdom is of a different sort, and so it's not in direct competition with the, the kingdoms of this world, right? Jesus even says so, right, himself in John 18. And so I want to take a look at that in light of the way that we interpret um, other elevated language in John. And so specifically looking at Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus and how we understand that that is a very spiritual encounter, but that encounter has ramifications in the physical. It's not uh, this dichotomized thing. And so if we interpret Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus in that light, then should we not apply a similar hermeneutic to uh, other elevated language um, and not falsely dichotomize those? So that's kind of the uh, you know basic goal that I have in this article. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but um, yeah, we'll just get on into it and you can rip it apart. So here it is. It's entitled Political Rebirth in the Kingdom of God. The book of John is among one of four Gospels in the New Testament, yet it is in a class of its own. While the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are considered synoptic Gospels, John is quite a bit different. John frames his Gospel to accentuate various teachings, particularly the teaching of the divinity of Jesus, the Christ. We get a glimpse of this elevation and framing from the very beginning of John's Gospel as we see Jesus, the Word, residing with God and creating the universe. John's gospel is filled with this elevation and emphasis on the spiritual aspect of the good news of Jesus. Whereas Luke is more the historian with his focus on eyewitness accounts and social political defense of Jesus in the early church, John is more the theologian. Perhaps one of the most beautiful theological exhibitions in the book of John is found in chapter 3. Of course, we're all familiar with verse 16, but... What concerns us here is not just verse 16's explanation of how our salvation obtains, but rather all that precedes this, and instead answers the question, what is obtained in our salvation? Verses 3-7 through here are of particular interest. 
and they say. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The salvation we see Jesus obtain for us in verse 16 is salvation in that it procures for us entrance into the kingdom of God by rebirth through the Spirit. We see this promise expounded upon later in John 14, where Jesus tells us that he will always be with us through his Spirit living in us, and through him we will do even greater works than Jesus. Jesus' salvation offer, then, is an offer of the kingdom of God by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through a new birth. I understand that none of this is likely new to most who are listening right now. However, understanding this simple teaching is going to be vital as we move into the crux of this piece. Therefore, I want to flesh out a few more things before moving on from simplicity. What we see in John 3 is an elevation of the spiritual. This elevation of the spiritual must be distinguished from a denouncing of the physical. Denouncing the physical and elevating the spiritual are two very different things, but are often conflated. One of the most prominent early heresies in Christianity was Gnosticism, this idea that the physical is bad. I'm not at all arguing, nor is John saying that the physical is bad. John isn't telling Nicodemus that he needs a new birth because his physicality is bad, but he's telling Nicodemus that the spiritual is superior. We know this because Jesus connects the kingdom of God in verses 3 and 5 seeing heavenly things in verses 12 and 13, and salvation in verses 15 through 18, with the new birth that's spiritual. We can also see in other New Testament writings that Jesus had to humble himself to take on flesh, Philippians 2, and that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable, 1 Corinthians 15. The Spirit is supreme. Again, the spiritual being supreme does not mean that the physical is bad. God created humanity as physical beings and called his creation good. Likewise, we will have bodily resurrections. To be human is to be physical, and that's good. However, the physical component is a tool whereby we live out the spirit. If the Bible isn't clear enough about this, we see it intuitively in regard to animals. Their physicality is beautiful, but because their souls are of a different kind, or because they don't have souls at all, maybe, They don't function as moral creatures who have relationship with God in the same way. Spirit is our connection to God, and our physicality is a tool, mind you, an integral tool to being human, to live out what we are as God-breathed spirit beings. We cannot divorce our physicality from our spiritual, nor can we call one component bad, but that doesn't mean we must avoid creating a hierarchy between the two. We see that hierarchy in John 3, in the rest of the New Testament, and we understand it intuitively. To help paint this picture more fully, let me refer to an early church document from the late 2nd century called The Letter to Diognetus. In this letter, the author says something which I think succinctly summarizes my point so far. He says, quote, Christians live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh, end quote. The author goes on to explain how this governance of the flesh is accomplished by the soul. The body for Christians has been appropriately made subservient to the soul. If you're tracking with me so far, you're probably on board with everything I've said, provided I sufficiently laid your fears that I'm not endorsing a Gnostic heresy. We're ready then to move deeper into the Gospel of John, to the place where we see the kingdom of God and the salvation envisioned in chapter 3 come to a head as the ruler of the kingdom of God comes face to face with a ruler of the kingdoms of man. In this encounter, Jesus declares that his kingdom is not from this world, John 18.36 in the NRSV. Unfortunately, Christendom has used this passage to produce a bastardized version of how we interpret the duality of spiritual and physical. And I want to explore this bastardization right now in light of what we have laid out from John 3, John 14, Philippians 2, 
1 Corinthians 15, and the letter to Diognetus. Christendom has used Jesus' spiritual attribution here to the kingdom in order to largely dismiss its implications for implementation. It has dismissed the reality of the big K kingdom of God both implicitly and explicitly. Implicitly, the kingdom of God has been dismissed by a Christendom which interprets the kingdom of God as being of another world and therefore separate from ours, which in reality changes the preposition of to for. So Jesus' kingdom, living, and prescriptions are of another world and therefore for that other world and not for this world. Such an interpretation has given birth to the consequentialist, realist framework that Christendom has run on ever since. Can I kill my enemy? Here in this world and in this kingdom, yes. But it's not ideal. I'd never do that in God's kingdom over there in the future. Can I do some evil that good may abound, like voting for a corrupt candidate who's at least better than the other guy, or lying if it produces what I determine are greater goods? Sure, I can do evil that good may abound in this kingdom right now, but I'd never do that in God's future kingdom over there. For Christendom and most Christian readers of John 18.36 today, God's kingdom is a future, spiritual kingdom which is divorced from present physical application, except where we and our political party want it to apply. Our actions prove that we implicitly interpret Jesus' words as making the kingdom irrelevant for our lives. But Christendom also explicitly interprets John 18.36 as making God's kingdom irrelevant. How is it that we uphold kings and presidents as legitimate rulers rather than usurpers of God whose power and foundation are Satan, the one who offered to Jesus these very kingdoms of the world? We do it because we declare Jesus' words in John 18.36 as proving God's kingdom is not a threat to Caesar's kingdom. We can serve God and mammon, Caesar and the Christ. Jesus proved the potential for this dual allegiance in John 18, Christendom says, in declaring that his kingdom doesn't conflict with Caesar's because there is room for a kingdom in each world. Yet somehow, nearly every Caesar and every ruler from Jesus until now has either sought to persecute Christians as a threat or co-opt them as a tool and prevent them from becoming a threat. Christendom explicitly interprets Jesus as making his kingdom irrelevant for the kingdoms because we take the co-opting route and like the power of the sword. I told you earlier to make sure you grasped our less controversial discussion of John 3. So right now I want to connect John 3 in our discussion to John 18.36 here. When we looked at the spiritual birth of John 3, we explained that this spiritual birth was supreme to the physical one. The physical birth is necessary and it is integral to who we are as humans. But the fleshly birth is a corruptible one which can't inherit the kingdom of God. Though the spiritual birth is supreme and what's in view for our salvation and new birth, the spiritual birth cannot be separated or divorced from our bodies. Rather, the spiritual birth, being of a supreme nature, transforms the physical. It will not only transform our physical bodies to become like Jesus' perfected body, the first fruits of our resurrection, but it also transforms our physical desires and actions now. This is why a new birth makes us new creations. It's why James declares that physical acts of service and love will accompany spiritual rebirth. Though the physical and spiritual are distinct, and though the spiritual is supreme to the physical, yet you cannot have the spiritual rebirth without the physical birth. And when you do have a spiritual rebirth, the physicality of the person responds in accord with the new spiritual man. It seems to me the same concept should carry over when we are interpreting John 18.36, as we use when we interpret John 3, 1-8, and John 1.13. God saves through spiritual rebirth, which is from another world, yet the spiritual rebirth recreates and reshapes the physical. It forms that which is formless and void, and that which is saturated in darkness, into new creations formed by the light of the world, the light of all mankind, by his very word. We get this theological truth when we see Nicodemus come to Jesus in the flesh. Why then, when we see Jesus' interaction with the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms in the flesh, do we bifurcate the spiritual and the physical? 
Why is Jesus' kingdom, that is from another world, practically irrelevant in relationship to Satan's kingdoms of the world? No, Jesus wasn't giving Caesar a head nod, telling him to not worry about any competition from Jesus. If we read John 18 like we read the rest of John and the rest of the New Testament, Caesar should have been shaking in his boots. For what Jesus was declaring was that his kingdom was far more relevant and powerful than the physical kingdoms of the world. Jesus' kingdom transformed the spiritual, which in turn terraformed the physical. The hearts and minds of the kingdom of heaven were made new, which led the early church to make society anew as the kingdom of God spread. Jesus' kingdom, being from another world and of the Spirit, made it more meaningful than Caesar's. Jesus didn't want to establish just another one of humanity's authoritarian kingdoms governed by the sword. He established a kingdom governed by the Spirit, formed by the testimony of Jesus, which is the sword of his mouth, and built on the word. Just as it was good news to Nicodemus that the new birth was spiritual and he didn't have to crawl up inside his mom's privates again and be defiled, so the spiritual composition of the kingdom is good news for us today. We don't have to crawl all up inside the corrupt political structures of domineering, sword-wielding consequentialism which lords power over others like Gentiles rather than being servants like Christ. Just as Jesus offered a new birth to Nicodemus, so can we be reborn without having to defile ourselves through compromise. I want to close out this piece with an extended quote from the letter to Diognetus, as I think a number of ideas that we have discussed are embodied in this excerpt. First, the author of Diognetus recognizes the supremacy of the soul and spirit and the subservient role that the body plays. At the same time, the author recognizes that it is through our physical bodies that our souls engage the world. To simplify, the spirit transforms our souls, which reform our bodies and physical actions, And through our physical actions, we touch other physical human beings whose souls are then touched through the reception of our service. Second, while Diognetus doesn't explicitly touch on John 18, I would argue that he implicitly shows us how he viewed the kingdom of God. Christians are not citizens of Rome, but rather citizens of heaven. There's not dual allegiance, and the Roman kingdom is not left untouched by the kingdom of God. Rather, the physical Roman kingdom is invaded by the kingdom of God, the kingdom which is from another world and spiritual. This invasion of the kingdom transforms Christians into the soul of Rome. As the author of the letter to Diognetus discusses in the quote below, Christians have been transformed to be the soul of the world. Being the kingdom of God doesn't make one seek to take control of the kingdoms of the world, nor does it make one irrelevant to them. Rather, just as John 3's new birth makes us more alive and more human, so living out the kingdom transforms the world and changes it to be antithetical to what it once was. If the kingdom isn't in opposition to the kingdoms, if the soul isn't warring against the flesh to subdue it, then the kingdom is being co-opted and controlled by the kingdoms, and the soul is being controlled by the passions of the body. So in closing, hear the words of the author, of the letter to Diognetus. Quote, Christians live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, So Christians are found in all the cities of the world, but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injury the soul has done it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. End quote. In the end, John's promise to us isn't that we can simply be reborn spiritually unto another future life, but rather that we can be reborn now in a way which allows us to more fully live our lives. This truth isn't only true on an individual level, but also on a structural, societal level. 
Not only can my sinful soul be reborn, but so can the corrupt soul of Gentile politics, which seeks to domineer and lord power through sword. We Christians ought to be the reborn soul of the world, whose politic is the church, and whose weapon is the testimony of Jesus, wielded as a sword from our mouths. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.